again. Here we are. Well, I wanted to begin this morning just doing a little recap because we've been looking at the book of John and right now we're looking at the miracles that Jesus did. And there, I just want to remind us what we looked at last week or a couple of weeks ago. We were looking at the feeding of the 5,000. And some of the takeaways that we got from that is um, Jesus comes and he gives us the bread. Of course, that represents his body. We saw a picture of communion in the feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus gave the disciples the bread to distribute to the people. And that one of the takeaways that we get from that miracle is that we as believers are so to feed the people Jesus. That's what we're to do. And that we're part of this kingdom of God and there's a work that we have to do. And so the miracle we're going to talk about today um, comes in John chapter 6. And it's immediately following the feeding of the 5,000. And when we talk about the book of John, we have to remember that John has a theme. And he talks about that in the very first chapter of his book. And the major theme, there are actually two themes that we see played out in the book of John. We see the fact that Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God and the word was God and Jesus was at the beginning Jesus is the word of God and we see that theme throughout the book of John he talks about the word of the kingdom and the word of the kingdom is a very specific word it's not every word that's in the Bible it's specifically the word of the gospel and the gospel message is this Jesus Christ came and died for you and because you accepted him as your savior, your sins are forgiven. You are forgiven not because of your actions. You are not forgiven because you're of your performance. You are forgiven because Jesus Christ died for you. And you accepted him as your savior. You received the grace of God. The grace of God does not demand performance. God is not making you jump through hoops to earn your salvation. Salvation is a free gift through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is the word of the kingdom that Jesus came preaching. Jesus came preaching to primarily the Hebrew nation. Now the Hebrew nation at this time had been living under thousands of years of the covenant that was forged with Moses, the law. And Jesus came preaching a new covenant, a covenant that was going to be based on his blood. And it was very difficult for Jesus to get the Hebrews to repent, to change their mind. They needed to change their mind about so many things. They needed to change their mind about how they saw God. They needed to change their minds about how they saw the world. They needed to change their minds about how they saw themselves. And Jesus was coming, preaching the message, no longer are you going to depend upon the blood of goats and bulls. You are going to need to put your faith in my blood. You're going to need to put your faith in the new covenant that the Messiah is bringing, and I'm him. And so that is the background we have. And so at the feeding of the 5,000, he fed the people the bread, and they were believing because of the miracle, but they were missing the sign. And the sign that was given was that Jesus is the Messiah that had been prophesied. He was feeding them the meal, which represented a covenant meal, and they missed the sign. And so that's where we're starting in John chapter 6. So, get this fired up. So, beginning in John chapter 6. And 
in verse 15. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. So, quite a miracle, amazing. I'm sure you've heard it talked about many, many times. We all know about Peter walking on the water. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about that. Because we, just like the, the Israelites, just like the people in Jesus' day, we look at the miracle, but we miss the sign. And really, What does the miracle about Jesus walking on the water have to do with you and I today? I mean, what do you want to walk on water for anyway? So what does that have to do with now, today? Well, there's a little phrase in here, and again, I'm teaching from some of Greg Greg Reether's, Gregory Reether's book, The Miracles of Jesus. And he pulls out the most amazing things. He pulls out these little lines that I just throw away, that I would never even think about, but they're important. As you're reading the Word of God, even the little lines that just seem like throwaway lines are important. And so knowing the background of the book of John and knowing the themes of the book of John, this one little word, this one little phrase has more meaning. So I want you to look at the verse just this little thing, verse 17. So, and actually it's 17b, just the last half, and it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. It was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. That's what we're going to look at today. It was already dark. I tell you what, if there's a phrase that makes me think of the world we're in today. It's that. It was already dark. Now in this setting, it was evening, so you would expect that darkness was coming. But there's an element of surprise here because it says it was already dark. So the darkness had come upon them quickly and unexpectedly. Well, we knew there was a storm brewing. You know, and we're living in a world where, yeah, it's dark. And, and we, I can feel it in my spirit. There's a storm brewing. And then this line, and Jesus had not come to them. You know, we are all, as believers, looking forward to the day when Jesus comes again. Because he is coming back. And sometimes it feels like we're here in the world and it's dark. And Jesus isn't coming. Now, why do I pull out this line, it is dark? It's because the book of John has themes. And we talked about that earlier. The book of John has the theme that Jesus is the word. But it also has another theme. And it's in John 1, starting in verse 6. John's witness, the true light. Now there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. 
But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among them, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus tells us that he is the light. We understand that the book of John is calling Jesus the light, the light of the world. The light came into the world, and the Jewish nation didn't recognize it. And the light has come into this world, into this darkness, and so often we don't recognize it. The darkness is come and we're not recognizing it. Light, man, the, I looked, <laughs> I looked just quickly here. The, the word light is referenced 230 times in scripture. And the first time we see it referenced is at the beginning of the book. In Genesis, the first words that God spoke were said, let there be light. Not only is light a theme in the book of John. It's a theme in the Bible itself. You know, without light, there would be no life. Without light, our plants would all die. We need light. The world needs light for its very existence. Revelations tells us that in the, in the, after the second coming, that Jesus will be the light There'll be no need for a son because we'll have Jesus as the light. He is the light of the world. He, he is the light. Oh, man, how does he say it here? He says, that is the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. That spark of life, light, electricity, whatever it is, it's in all of us. This life is in us. And it came to the Hebrew nation, it came to the Jews of that day, and they saw the miracle. They missed the sign. They missed the sign. And here are the disciples. They've been given a command. Now Jesus, after after he fed the 5,000, they wanted to raise up now and make him king. But you know, Jesus didn't come to, become, didn't come to this earth to be an earthly king. He came to be the king of kings. And it wasn't something that man could give to him. It was something that he had to go to the cross to receive. And so even though they wanted to crown him king right there, and there were thousands of people. They could have had a coup of the government and overthrown everything. No, Jesus knew that that wasn't, he wasn't here for the accolades of people. He knew that these people were just caught up in the moment. They weren't really putting their trust in him. And so he and the disciples slipped away and he went up into the mountains to pray. And he gave the disciples a command to go over to Capernaum, to go over to the land where new ministry was waiting. And in order to get to the land, they had to go over the sea, over the water. And water, when it's a big body of water like this in scripture, stands for chaos. We see that at the beginning. In the beginning, the spirit of the Lord hovered over the waters. And it's a picture of God making order out of disorder. And so the disciples are going across. They've been given a command. They should have known everything was fine. But what happens as they're going on their mission, they're going to the goal that God has given them, a storm comes up. And suddenly it's no longer about getting to their mission it's about surviving. 
because the waves are rising, the wind is blowing, and what are the disciples doing? They are using everything they know. They're using their strength. They're using their know-how. These were fishermen. They knew how to run a boat. They're using everything they know in their physical being to get through this problem. And they're failing. Been there? I've been there. And where everything looks so dark, where fears are swamping me, thoughts are assailing me, where I don't know up from down, everything looks black, and I don't know where to turn. And that's, that's where we are in the church right now. The church, man, when we look back at the beginning of the church, Jesus gave the church a command. Jesus gave the Great Commission. He said, go into the world and preach the gospel, baptizing people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the church started really well with the disciples and with the Holy Spirit. There were miracles. There was power. People were being saved. 5,000 one day, thousands at a time. It was wonderful. And within one generation, darkness began to fall. And when I mean darkness, I don't mean sin. I don't. I don't. Because when we look at the book of John, we've got this dichotomy. We've got these two things that are going on. Remember the theme of John is that Jesus is trying to present the word of the kingdom for the Israelites to receive the gospel that there's this new covenant that's not based on performance it's based on the blood of Jesus it's not based on what you do it's not based on how much you give it's not based on your performance at all it's based on Jesus and darkness is what was coming into the church Paul had to write about it. He wrote about it in Galatians, where the Galatians began to go back to the Old Testament laws and say that, oh, yes, yes, of course, Jesus saves, but you have to add circumcision. That was what was happening in Galatians. The Judaizers were coming in and saying, oh, yes, Jesus saves. That sacrifice is sufficient, but... You have to follow all the laws. You have to become a Jew. That's what the Galatians thought. And Paul was amazed. He said, I'm amazed. I'm astounded that you've been bewitched. Who's bewitched you to believe these lies? Who's taken the gospel and made it into another gospel? Not like there is another gospel. There's the real gospel, which is salvation by grace through faith. And then there's a lie. And very quickly, the church entered into darkness. And they began adding tithing. And they began adding confession. And they began adding rituals to their salvation. And the church, in many denominations, is still in darkness. Their boat has wandered off. You know, their sail got set in a different direction. And the church, even today, we have the message of grace, which, man, sets so many of us free. Hallelujah. To hear that God loves us, that he accepts us, he's not demanding anything of us, he just wants us to receive his love. What a blessing. And a lot of churches, they hear the message of grace. A lot of people, they hear the message of grace, and they're just like the disciples. They see the message of grace coming, and they see a ghost. And they're afraid. They're afraid. Well, I can't teach my people that. If you teach people that God just loves them, then they're going to go crazy. They're going to run off into sin and 
just do all kinds of fleshly things. When the Word of God te- teaches us that grace teaches us to live godly, it, grace teaches us to be holy, grace teaches us to be grateful, grace teaches us that we're new creations in Christ. I don't know anyone that believes grace who is leading openly sinful lives because we recognize we have a new nature. We know who we are. And yet the church sees the message of grace. And a lot of them go, oh, if we don't teach the people to tithe, how are we going to get any money? I'm sorry, that's the truth. That's the truth. No. And it's a shame that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been darkened by theology of men. And so it's dark. It's dark. And they see Jesus coming. And either they're scared because he's a ghost, you know, ooh, they're terrified, or they just view it as kind of invisible. You know, grace is kind of invisible. That was where I was, you know. Yeah, grace was something. I never heard a message about grace growing up. Never heard a message about grace in in the Word of Faith movement. It, yeah, grace, that was that unmerited favor. What did that mean? It meant nothing. Grace, as Strong defines it, is the divine influence on our heart that guides us and leads us. God's divine influence on your heart. Grace was that divine influence on your heart that brought you to Jesus. And grace is the power of God that changed you. And grace is the power of God that leads you, that walks with you. Grace is Jesus. This is the Holy Spirit. God is grace. And he lives in you. And he changes you. He's molding you. He's creating you. He's making you this, you are a brand new creature. And that divine influence is changing your mind. It's changing how you think. Grace is so much more. I had someone tell me, well, that's just too simple. I'm like, simple, no, this is the deepest message I know. I don't know anything deeper than the grace of God. His love, maybe. But they're so intertwined. It's, it's all him. So here we are. It's dark. You know, it's dark, and Jesus hadn't come. And when, they, when he did come, at last, they recognized him. You know, and in your world, in your darkness, before you came to Christ, Jesus came to you as grace, and you recognized him. And immediately, he got in your boat and he took you to the other side. You know? Now, there are a lot of people out there that are struggling in their boat. They're struggling in the darkness. Man, they are bailing. They are tying down the sails. They are rowing with all their might. You know? And they're trying to have a ministry at the same time. And you know what? It does no good for someone stuck in the dark to pull someone else into their boat. Then you're all just struggling with all your might and bailing and crying and fearful and, and knowing that, man, nothing I can do can save myself. But man, when you see Jesus, when you recognize his grace, then instantly he takes you to the other side to that side where ministry begins. Hallelujah. 
Now, Jesus came into the world, and he is the light of the world. And then he did something amazing. What was his message to the disciples? What was his message to us? Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You. He said, you are the salt in this earth. You. And there are a lot of Christians out there, a lot of churches out there, that have no idea, they have no clue that they are light, that they are salt. Jesus said, you know, you know, we shouldn't hide our light with a basket. We should let our light shine. And salt that has lost its saltiness is just tossed out. And a lot of churches out there are covering their light. They've lost their salt. What does that mean? I'll tell you what. If you do not understand the message of grace, if you do not understand that God loves you unconditionally, that God himself has made you holy and righteous, that there's nothing you can do that can change how God feels towards you, that God loves you with the same love that he loves Jesus, now that sounds like an astounding statement, doesn't it? See, man, if I'm trying to be humble, I'm saying, oh, that can't be true. No, that is not humility. That is pride. That is saying, I'm so bad that God can't love me. And that's a lie. God is love. None of us are deserving of that kind of love. God doesn't love you because you deserve it. God doesn't love you because you earned it. God loves you because he is love. And he chose to love you. God said, I will have mercy on whoever I choose. And God chose you. And it's part of our walk in this life to come to that knowledge and to accept that God loves us. I used to have a hard time with that. You know, I'd look in the mirror and I'd go, how can, you know, God, what do you love about me? And he says, everything. That's Randy and I tell the grandkids, what do we love about you? Everything. You know, we're planting a seed so that they can receive unconditional love. And you need to receive unconditional love. God loves everything about you. But I do these things. God loves everything about you. And if there's something that he wants to change, he will. Because he sees the reality of who you are because he knows who you are in your spirit. And your spirit is holy and righteous and perfect because your spirit is one with his spirit. And when God looks at you, he sees himself reflected back. The word of God is like a mirror when we look into the word of God, we are seeing ourselves. All those things. Oof. Mind bend. It's a mind bend. That's okay. You know what? We've got all of eternity to get our mind unbent. Hallelujah. So, how does light get covered? How does salt lose its saltiness? When someone doesn't understand the message that God loves them unconditionally, their light is dimmed. It is so hard to minister the love of God, so God to someone if you haven't received it for yourself. 
it's so hard to minister unconditional love of the unconditional love to someone if you if you're not ready to receive it for yourself you can minister but your ministry is going to be dimmed if you don't understand how much god loves you i'm not saying stop ministering but i'm saying your ministry is not going to be as effective your salt is going to be less salty. What do I mean by salt? Well, what does salt do? I, you know, I cook. I'm the only one who cooks at my house. <laughs> and uh, man, you add a little salt to give it a little flavor. You add too much, eh, <laughs> not so good. Add not enough, eh, you know. But salt changes the flavor of everything in the stew. And you are salt in this earth. You change the flavor of everyone you're around. When you're involved in a group, the group is changed by your input. But if you're not understanding that God loves you and God loves your neighbor with that unconditional love, then in that group, you're not salty. You're not the influence that's going to change life. How do we be salty? Well, God wants us to just live, to just be. See, it's not hard for light to be light. It doesn't have to make any great effort. It just is. And what does light do? Light dispels darkness. It's, it doesn't have to try hard. It just has to be. I can remember years ago going through Wind Cave out in the hills. Randy and I went, and, and down in the dark, you're down in that cavern, and they, they always shut all the lights down. And you can't see a thing, except I had my little luminous watch on. And you know what? That little bit of light from my watch, I could see. I could see my hand. Nothing else but that little bit of light from my watch dispelled the darkness around it. And that's what you do in this world. You dispel the darkness around you. That's why people come to you when they're having a problem. They see the Jesus in you. They come to you. you. You find yourself going, oh, why do people always come and tell me all their problems? Because they see the Jesus in you. Because you know the solution. You know the answer to their questions. It's Jesus. When you speak, they feel peace. When you speak, you're able to lift their burdens a little bit. And God wants your light to shine fully so that not only are you able to lift that burden momentarily, but you're able to introduce them to the Jesus that will remove it completely. That's what God wants for us. That's what God's put in us. We are the light of the world. And God wants your salt to be salty, not to the degree that you have put people off, that you're overpowering, but that you temper things, that your little bit of influence changes the atmosphere around them. I know Bud does that where he works. I've heard him talk about it. And whether you know it or not, you do that where you work. You do that in your home. Moms, you do that in your home. You set the mood. And the more you find time to let Christ minister love and grace to your heart, the more you come to understand that God loves you, the more you're going to be able to show that to your children and have less stressful days. Because that's what God wants for us. God doesn't want us out in the storm. God wants to come and calm that sea 
and take us to the place of ministry where we can be light and salt to the world. That's what he wants to do. Because he has not left us. He ha- it's not that Jesus has not come. It's dark, but we can't say like it did in this little miracle that Jesus has not come because he has. His name is the Holy Spirit. We are not alone in the dark. We are never alone. We are not without Jesus here in this darkness. No matter what the darkness is. I don't know. You might be having problems financially. You might be having problems health-wise. You might be concerned about a relative. I don't care what your darkness is. The light will dispel it. The Holy Spirit is with you to comfort you, to guide you, to lead you into all peace. And you have that role for other people. You can comfort people with the comfort you've received. You can guide people because the guide lives in you. You can bring up to that peace that passes understanding into their life. Because when people are in a boat and the storm is raging, they need someone to step into the boat and say, peace, be still. We don't have Jesus here physically, but you have Jesus with you. And this is part of our ministry to one another, is to step into someone's life and say, peace, be still. The wind and the waves know your name because they know Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The miracle's wonderful. Don't miss the sign. Don't miss the sign. The sign is that you are a child of God. You have the Holy Spirit living in you. The enemy is going to blow. The enemy is going to try and dissuade you, try and convince you that you can't trust this Jesus. But we know the truth. We don't listen to the lies. We refocus. We don't keep our eyes on the waves. We don't keep our eyes on the water. We keep our eyes on Jesus. And he leads us into truth. He leads us into peace. He makes everything calm. Everything. Doesn't matter what the world is doing. Doesn't matter what's happening in your life. You can float through this thing on a sea of glass because the Holy Spirit lifts you. Hallelujah. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, that you stepped into our boat, that you took us into yours, that you lead us and you guide us and you comfort us. Father God, we thank you that because you live in us, we can be light, we can be salt to the world around us. Father, help us focus our minds. Help us see the reality that is you. Remind us, Father, who we are. Remind us, Father, who you are. Thank you, Father, that though in this world we have tribulation, you have overcome it. Hallelujah.